Okay, well, um, I have nine o'clock, so we're going to begin. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Gary Chauvin with the TCEQ's Water Supply Division. I uh, want to welcome everyone to our October uh, DWOG meeting. The DWOG is a drinking water advisory work group. Uh, we have four meetings uh, every year. We have them every three months, every quarter. They're in January, um, April, July, and October. So this, our, this concludes our meetings for the, for the year of 2018. Uh, I want to thank everyone who braved the, hey Joaquin, <laughs> I want to thank everyone who braved the weather to get here, um, travel safe. Um, as y'all know, and if, you, if, um, if you're not aware, this meeting is webcast, so we have the opportunity for folks to tune in remotely uh, from wherever they're at, and we certainly welcome participation that way. Uh, um, increases our viewership and uh, participation in the meeting. If you are viewing today, uh, you can interact with the meeting via email with your questions or comments. Uh, we will be checking that regularly throughout the meeting today. You can send an email to dwag, which is D-W-A-W-G, at T-C-Q dot Texas, which is spelled out, dot gov, G-O-V. Again, if you're tuning in remotely, please email us with your questions or comments throughout, throughout the, the morning at dwag, D-W-A-W-G, at tcq.texas.gov. Um, I did want to make note uh, for, um, for everyone that there is a new actual URL link to the webcast, so just be aware of that. Uh, if we get any questions coming in where folks can't access it today, we will be able to send them that new link uh, for, for where you can access the webcast. But that was just updated this quarter, and, and so we do have a new actual URL where you launch the webcast from. Uh, <clears throat> the format for the meeting, uh, as always, is we go through some uh, um, programmatic updates from our, our public water system supervision program, and then we have some presentations uh, later this morning. So I'm going to jump in and begin with our first update. Uh, that is, uh, we have uh, Mr. Irwin Madrid here with us today from Occupational Licensing. Irwin, go ahead. Thank you, Gary. Um, this is my first time here, so do I just speak into this microphone? Sure. Okay, Perfect. I'm doing good so far. Okay. <laughs> um, like Gary said, my name is Erwin Madrid. I'm one of the work leaders in the occupational licensing section. Uh, I'm filling in today for my team lead, Derek Patton. Um, I'll start off just by reading off some numbers for our fourth quarter uh, that concluded in August. Um, for our backflow prevention assembly tester licensing program, we had 131 new applications received. Uh, we had 306 renewal applications. We administered 268 exams, 120 of which were passing scores for a passing rate of 44.8%. We issued 107 new licenses, renewed 342, and the ground total current licenses for backflow is 5,836 current licenses. The next license program here is the Customer Service Inspector License. We received 91 new applications, 98 renewals. We administered 171 exams, 83 of which were passing scores for a passing rate of 48.5%. We issued 77 new licenses and renewed 112. And the total current licenses for this program is 2,042. Um, the next one is our water operator licensing programs. We received 909 new applications, 997 renewals. We administered 1,554 exams, of which 621 were passing scores for a 40% passing rate. We issued 592 new licenses, renewed 1,037, and the total current licensee list for this program is 16,609 uh, current licenses. 
Uh, next, I'd like to talk a little bit of our major update, our new item that's going on in licensing, which is um, as of last week, October 11th, I believe, is when it was uh, pushed out to the public, which is our new occupational licensing electronic application. Um, so we're in the midst of that. Um, we, we are hitting the ground hard with that. Uh, it, OLEA is kind of what it's being called, uh, O-L-E-A, and it replaced our previous electronic application, and we hope this application is much more user-friendly, uh, much more, uh, it has m more features as far as an applicant being able to start the application and saving it, closing it, getting out, coming back to it later. Um, it has the ability to create a login password so you can save your work. Um, the payment portal was integrated to it, so you no longer have to go out, pay, come back to it, enter a number. It's all streamlined um, rather well. So um, if anybody out there is exp going through this online application, has any feedback, any comments, we, we welcome those at this time. Um, so that that's the main thing. Also, occupational licensing is currently fully staffed now. So with all the new licensing program, uh, the new application testing, our application review time kind of was impacted a little bit, but we are hoping to get our new staff trained and catch up to our um, the turnaround times that we had before. Um, that's, that's pretty much all I have. I'm available to answer any questions um, now or if, uh, feel free to contact our licensing department. It's the uh, email address is licenses, L-I-C-E-N-S-E-S -E -S -E -S at T-C-E-Q dot Texas, T-E-X-A-S dot gov or our phone number is 512-239-6133. Thank you. Thank you for your report, Erwin. Are there any questions for Erwin? Um, I want to remind everybody that we do send out staff summaries. We sent those out uh, for the programmatic staff summaries uh, via email yesterday, but they also are posted to our DWOG webpage. And you can get to our DWOG webpage by just you know, doing a search for DWAWG DWOG and TCQ, and that'll take you right to the link for that. And, um, our presentations will be posted there later today as well, so that's a one-stop shop for, for um, material we cover here in this meeting. Thank you very much, Earl. We appreciate your report. Our next update is from Tom Heitman with the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. Good morning. Thank you, Gary. Uh, for compliance and enforcement, for FY18, we currently had 687 complaint investigations. Now, those investigations could have multiple complaints involved in that. Uh, we had 248 focused investigations, 84 compliance record reviews, 59 follow-up, 571 recon investigations, and 1,668 comprehensive com compliance investigations, and that's for community and non-community systems. Uh, and I'm available for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any questions for, for Tom? Okay, thanks again, Tom. We're gonna to move on to our next update uh, from the manager with, of the plan and technical review section, Mr. Joel Klump. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as, as Gary mentioned, uh, it looks to be, yes. Is that better? Testing one, two. All right. Um, again, my name is Joel Klump. I'm manager of the plan and technical review section. And as Gary mentioned in the um, staff summary updates that were emailed out yesterday and also available through the web page, there's some information about teams in my section, um, such as numbers of plan reviews completed over the last three months, exceptions, and so on. I'd like to just point out a couple highlights from our staff summary 
and then turn things over briefly to Dorothy Young, who's with us here this morning. Um, the plan review team is now fully staffed. They added a new engineer in August. Um, the technical review and oversight team also added a new team member um, this month, earlier this month. The response and capacity development team um, continues their various activities, including the Texas Optimization Program. Our drought group is also housed under that team. Um, and the good news with all of this rain is that drought conditions are looking much better than they were several months back. Um, we also have other program areas, cross-connection control and assistance for at-risk public water systems, and our regular work continues for those uh, programs. Dorothy, if you could talk to us about updates for capacity development and uh, the Texas Water Infrastructure Coordination Committee. Good morning. Um, the Texas Water Infrastructure Coordination Committee, or TWIC, meets every other month, and it's a group of regulatory funding and assistance agencies that come together to talk about projects for water and wastewater systems. We invite guests, and the next meeting is going to be on Thursday, November 15th, at the Texas Rural Water Association. That address is 1616 Rio Grande here in Austin. Jason Knobloch will be hosting it from the uh, TRWA if you're interested or know of somebody who'd like to be on the agenda. Uh, last meeting, for instance, which was hosted by the Texas Department of Agriculture, we had a town come in that was trying to find funding to do an interconnect with the neighboring water supply corporation. They had an opportunity to talk to three or four funding agencies all at once. We got uh, uh, Communities Unlimited, which is an assistance provider. Uh, volunteered to help coordinate that. So it's a good opportunity if folks are looking for funding or want to brainstorm about regional projects. We also do workshops around the, the state as, uh, as asked for and every year at our drinking water conference. TWIC itself does not have funding, but what we do is we pull, pull together the folks who do along with those who have um, provide assistance getting that funding out. And speaking of funding, um, on my to-do list is a 362-page bill that is on the President's desk right now, um, which I haven't read, but I've read highlights of. It's called the America's Water Infrastructure Act. And one of the things um, that's interesting from a capacity development standpoint, we work with a lot of water systems that are struggling because they need to be either restructured or they've been abandoned or have serious compliance issues. This bill requires consolidation assessments of certain water systems, and also requires a uh, study to Congress on something called intractable water systems. So um, th we'll be learning more about that and if once it's signed and, and gets into place. It also increases funding for some of our drinking water programs. Anybody have any questions for me? Yes, Ruth. Ruth, do you have a bill number on that? I think it's, I've left it on my desk, but I think it's Senate 3021. But if you just, is that right, Charlie? Right. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, okay, and then to conclude the update for the plan and technical review section, I'd like to address a question that we received yesterday via email. Um, this came in from an engineer, um, and it regards uh, the approval process for new water wells or new surface water connections. So I'd just like to ask quickly if that individual who submitted this is here with us in the room today. Okay, then I'll address this in a general fashion and hope that um, the individual is joining us online. So the question relates to um, the approval process, like I mentioned, for new water wells um, or a new surface water connection. And the individual notes that they're regularly adding new sources of water to um, the public water systems that they represent Obviously, there's deadlines for getting those projects completed. And so the question regards a staff guidance document that is put out by my section. And the name of the staff guidance document is Drinking Water Corrosion-Related Engineering Report Requirements. So let me step back a little bit and talk about 
uh, my section in general and then kind of drill down into what the staff guidance document is uh, meant to address and then get back to the question. So again, in the plan and technical review section, we've got three teams. Um, we heard from Dorothy already. Um, we'll also be hearing from another representative of her team, the Response and Capacity Development Team. Um, and he will be speaking about uh, level two assessments under RTCR. But let me talk about the other two teams in my section. There's the plan review team who, um, surprise, focuses on plan reviews. And then there's the technical review and oversight team. And one of the major functions of the technical review and oversight team, or TROT, is to review exceptions. All new sources and most changes to long-term treatment are evaluated for their effect on corrosivity. And that requirement is part of the lead and copper rule. Um, and the lead and copper rule program is actually housed um, under our drinking water standards section. But staff in my section support that program um, through the review of new sources and changes in treatment. Part of our evaluation process is to use a model to evaluate potential corrosivity. The model that we use is the AWWA Tetratech model. And the results of the model, um, we essentially grade a, a, drink, a water as either non-corrosive, slightly corrosive, or corrosive. Um, and in our guidance document here, we talk about situations where a water system would need to submit additional information to us because we have concerns about potential corrosivity. And essentially, if during the review of a new source or a change in treatment, if we see our model results showing either slight corrosivity or corrosivity, we will require additional information. So the simplest um, process is through our plan review team. And our plan review team um, evaluates plans and specifications for new sources, changes in treatment in cases where no exception is required. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But provided that everything is able to meet the design criteria in our Chapter 290 rules, then the only team that you'll be dealing with in my section is the plan review team. And once plans and specs are submitted, we will run the Tetratech model, and if the results show non-corrosive water, then approval can be granted and the water system can, can go down the road and proceed. If the results of the model show slight corrosivity, then a conditional approval is granted with the requirement for a follow-up engineering report. And this guidance document is meant to explain what we expect to see in that follow-up engineering report. If the results of the model show that the new source or the change in treatment results in corrosive water, we will not be able to grant approval for that, and we will request either uh, the engineering report be submitted to explain what will be done to mitigate that corrosivity or to explain why your model results differ from ours and to make a case that um, it, corrosivity is not actually an issue. Alternatively, the water system can say, we agree our evaluation shows potential corrosivity and we're going to install some type of corrosion control treatment. So back to the question, which was, um, does a water system need to submit this engineering report? Essentially, when and how do they need to submit the engineering report? And the short answer is, if the water system is just going through the plan review process, um, then as long as the water doesn't show to be corrosive, we will be able to approve that new source or change in treatment and that report just comes in later. Um, again, if the water showed to be corrosive, then we won't be able to grant approval, and my recommendation would be call us up, let's discuss what needs to happen next. 
Okay, now to dig a little bit deeper into the exception process under our technical review and oversight team. If a new treatment process is proposed and we don't have design criteria in Chapter 290 for that treatment process, then we classify that as innovative or alternate. And in that case, an exception is required before plans are submitted. Or if a source is being proposed and the design criteria for that source don't meet our rules, an exception will be required. Exceptions are always required prior to plan submittal and so we may address corrosivity concerns during the exception process rather than the plan review process if an exception is needed. For many exceptions for innovative alternate treatment, a pilot study is required. And so one option during the pilot study is to include corrosion control treatment and then include the results of the effectiveness of that treatment as part of the pilot study report. So to recap situations where an exception is required, typically TROT would approve the pilot study protocol and then the pilot study report, and then it would go over to the plan review team. But if exceptions are involved, clearly additional steps are required. I don't think that's what the individual was asking in, uh, in their email. But my recommendation, if an exception is required, is to give us a call and schedule a pre-application, a pre-submittal meeting, and we can talk through that. Exceptions are granted on a case-by-case -case basis, and so each situation may be slightly different. Um, so you can always call us up in advance and get some additional guidance. All right, I hope that I addressed that question. Um, if anybody has questions about that process or any of the other programs under the plan and technical review section, I'd be happy to field any questions. Yes, sir, Angel. Thanks, Joel. I, I really appreciate the information. Uh, my name is Angel Bustamante. I work for El Paso Water. And I could definitely relate to that question. Um, we've asked that internally uh, back in El Paso. And um, our system is considered a relatively large system. So uh, we're continuously looking to add new wells to our system. So every time we add a new well, it's considered a new source. My question is, does TCQ, in addition to that Petrotech model, do they take into account historic results from past lead and copper? Because we don't have any lead and copper hits. And if the water quality from a particular well that's under review is very similar, Sure, thank you. Let me repeat the question so that everybody can, uh, joining us online can hear the question. So the, the question came from El Paso Water Utilities, which has uh, quite a few um, wells and is apparently regularly adding additional wells to the system. And the question is, does TCEQ take into account historic lead and copper sample results for uh, existing groundwater sources when a new source with similar water quality from a, the same aquifer is put online? And the answer to that question is um, that we certainly do, as part of our review process, take a look at compliance history for lead and copper for a particular water system, but that our current procedure is to treat every new source as having the potential to impact corrosivity um, until we have additional information from when that source is put online. And so we, at this time, are not able to waive any kind of review for potential corrosivity for a well, for a, for a new well, even if it comes from uh, an aquifer where there are other wells currently um, in use. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Um, that TetraTech model, um, that's available for, for anyone to, to download and purchase? Correct. Yes, it's through uh, AWWA. And if you do, uh, again, a Google search uh, for AWWA TetraTech, that, that will show up. Thanks. Thank you. OK, any other questions? And I will be available when we break this morning. So uh, if you'd like to talk one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be happy to talk. Thank you.
Great, Joel. Thank you very much for going through uh, and addressing that question and providing your updates. Uh, next, uh, we're going to go to, to my section, the drinking water standards section. Um, just a, an overview of our section. We handle compliance determination for the national primary drinking water regulations. So that includes the surface and groundwater rules. It includes the revised total coliform rule, uh, all of your chemical, uh, organic and inorganic rules. Um, and then we handle the, the processing and compliance determination associated with our monthly operating reports for either surface water or the disinfectant level quarterly, quarterly operating report uh, and disinfectant residuals. So um, our, our section is composed of two teams. Um, we're gonna hear from the team leaders here in just a minute. We, are, um, we have the drinking water assessment team and the drinking water quality team. Uh, I really just have one update this morning. Uh, if you've been paying attention, um, obviously lead testing in schools is, has been a really important topic uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I, I just want to remind folks that we uh, engaged in a series of workshops through, through our lead and copper rule program and also with the help of our uh, environmental assistance division. Um, we conducted a series of workshops across the state, I believe there were seven or eight, all through uh, last uh, fiscal year. And we, we conducted presentations based on the EPA uh, literature that helps schools if they want to engage in testing for lead. And that's called the three T's. Uh, it was formerly known as training, testing, and telling. So an important update on that, uh, EPA has taken some action and updated this, this manual um, just last month as of September 2018. Uh, they've, they've actually changed the name. Uh, it is now Training, Testing, and Taking Action. Uh, they, they just launched this. They have an entirely new website. They've broken the three T's. Uh, they call it a three T's toolkit now. Uh, and they've broken that up into seven modules. Uh, and there's some significant changes to it. Uh, I think uh, across the states, it's been a very valuable tool, and it's been very helpful as a guide for any school that wants to do this on their own. As, you, as, as many of you all know, um, the majority of schools are not their own public water system. They're a customer of mostly a municipal or some other type of, of community water system. So um, they, there is no federal uh, law for testing lead in schools specifically. Uh, unless they happen to be a public water system themselves. So this 3T's toolkit has been a very valuable resource for, for anybody who wants to communicate how this uh, testing should be done, and of course for schools themselves that want to engage in this testing. And then also understanding what their results mean and critically communicating that out to their staff, their students, and, and parents, and what actions they're doing to address uh, any, any elevated uh, lead results they find in their in their facilities. So uh, this is this is a very important and significant update. So I want to make y'all aware of that. Um, we have updated our webpage just as of yesterday. So our lead testing in schools webpage is up to date with a link uh, to the new three T's toolkit. You'll find three links. You'll find a link to the to the main splash page for the three T's uh, updated toolkit. You will find a link directly to the PDF. So if you, want to, if you want to download the entire manual for the three T's, that's its own separate link. And then there's a third link that takes you to this brochure that I have here in front of me. It's a, it's a nice handy color brochure uh, that basically spells out the updates or the changes, the revisions made to the new version. So all three of those links you can find um, at the very top of our, of our lead testing in schools webpage, our TCQ. If you type in TCQ, lead testing or lead, lead in schools, you'll, you'll come to that page. Uh, so please check that out and, and spread the word. So what we're gonna be doing, we had, we had presentations that we used to conduct the work, workshops last year. We're gonna be updating those presentations uh, based on the new materials from the three T's. Um, we're looking to do that just as soon as we can. Um, I, hopefully, I, I'll, through, the, through the DWOG email, I'll try to get a timeline for that update. We're, we're already making plans to work on that. Um, and so those presentations, once they are ready, they will be posted back to our Lead Testing in Schools webpage. And for any school or any, any citizen to use uh, and review and hopefully uh, help them in their endeavors 
uh, as they see fit for lead testing in their facilities. Any questions about that? Okay, well, I certainly encourage you all to go take a look uh, just to be knowledgeable about this important topic. And like I said, we will be working on presentations to update, uh, to include and incorporate the new material from the EPA on their newly revised, now known three T's, uh, training, testing, and taking action. With that, I'm gonna go to our team leaders. Um, first, we're gonna have an update from Ms. Jessica Hoke from the Drinking Water Assessment Team. Hello. <clears throat> Uh, as Gary said, my name is Jessica, and I am the team lead for the Drinking Water Assessment Team. For any of y'all who are not familiar with the team and the makeup between Brittany and I's team, um, the Drinking Water Assessment Team includes the compliance programs for the revised total coliform rule, the groundwater rule, and the lead and copper rule. So um, I don't really have a whole lot of updates this um, meeting, but I did have a few for the groundwater rule, and um, we've got Matt Court, who is our senior compliance officer for the groundwater rule here, that'll be doing a presentation um, this morning just about some um, groundwater rule requirements and kind of some updates over the past year. So in general, for the groundwater rule, there's two main um, types of compliance samples that you would be taking, one of them being a triggered source monitoring sample. So groundwater si systems that have a positive in their routine monthly distribution RTCR samples are required to take a triggered source monitoring raw sample from each active well in use. So if you had multiple routine monthly distribution samples that came back positive, you need to collect a TSM raw from your well, coliform for each positive at each active well that happened. Um, and Matt will go into that a little bit more if y'all have any additional questions related to that in his presentation. Um, and just a few numbers related to the third quarter groundwater rule compliance. Uh, we had 18 E. coli positive raw samples. Um, anytime that there is an E. coli positive raw <clears throat> excuse me, E. coli positive um, result from one of your raw uh, well samples that requires a corrective action that might include um, chlorinating the well or depending on the compliance up until that point, you know, four log uh, treatment is an effective tool for the groundwater rule. And again, I think Matt will be talking a little bit about that. Um, the other type of sampling that you might be doing for the groundwater rule would be assessment source monitoring. And so if you are required to meet the requirements of an exception request that would have come out of Joel's section, um, you may need to collect an assessment source monitoring sample. And that again is another raw sample from your actual well. Um, and the details of your assessment source monitoring requirements would be included in your exception request letter. So if it needed to be two samples a month taken at least 10 days apart or one sample a month or, or whatnot, those sorts of details would be, like I said, in that particular letter for your system. Um, an important thing, and I'll, I'll talk about this for RTCR, is that it's really important to mark your microbial reporting form appropriately when you're taking your samples. So for the groundwater rule samples, those are raw samples, and so you would mark the raw. And um, you want to make sure that on that form that you're only checking one box, because um, there's differences in compliance depending on what box is chosen. And we do have guidance for the microbial reporting form on the RTCR website, if y'all have any questions related to that. Um, so moving on into the RTCR uh, compliance program. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be having a presentation also this morning uh, related to RTCR level one assessments and sample siting plans. And so every system is required to have a sample siting plan. And so we are encouraging y'all to always be taking a look at what you've got and making sure that it's accurate and it's up to date with the sampling sites that you're actually using at this point in time. And you want to make sure that your uh, sample siting plan is representative of your drinking water throughout your distribution system. Um, there is a sample siting plan template that is available for download on the RTCR website. We have noted from some feedback that the link to download it works best in Internet Explorer as opposed to Google Chrome or Firefox or anything else. 
Um, if you have any questions related to the sample siting plans, you can reach out directly to Lillian Johnson. She's one of the RTCR compliance officers and she has a particular focus on SSPs. And you can also uh, feel free to submit an updated sample siting plan to the TCEQ via email at the TCR data at tceq.texas.gov. Um, and I just wanted to take a minute to reiterate that the RTCR program um, is continuing an ongoing sort of QAQC project for the adequacy of the documentation when y'all are submitting your samples. Um, so you just want to make sure that for public water systems that you're including all of the required information on your MRF before you turn it over to the laboratory. You know, we've given guidance to the laboratories to try and catch some of those things, um, but you know, ultimately it is the responsibility of the public water system to fill out all of the required sections of the MRF that are required for the public water system. And so we do have some guidance um, on the microbial reporting form that can be found on the RTCR and the PWSS uh, web pages, and I put links in the uh, updates for that. And there's two separate guidance documents, and so that's important to check out. And honestly, I would look at both of them just so that way you have an idea of what each person's looking for in this sort of <clears throat> laboratory public water system relationship. So we have a public water system guidance for the MRF, and we have laboratory guidance for the MRF. And just another thing that I'll continue to reiterate, um, it's, I really encourage all of the public water systems to do some contingency planning in case they end up with an E. coli positive that happens on a Friday or over a weekend where your local laboratory might be closed or you might have some issues, to have some um, relationships established with other laboratories or to plan ahead in your sampling if you're a system that only needs to take one or two samples a month to make sure that you're doing that earlier in the week so that you don't find yourself in a situation where you're struggling to find a laboratory because if you've got <clears throat> a sample that comes back with a positive microbial result like that should indicate to you that something's going on and so you want to make sure that you have relationships set up so that you can continue to test in your public water system to figure out whether that was an anomalous result or whether there truly is something going on, in which case you might need to do public notice or a boil water notice and things like that. Um, so moving on to the lead and copper program, I just have one major update related to lead and copper, aside from the new three T's that's coming out and we're working on that <clears throat> revised guidance for y'all. The lead consumer notices. So if you monitored in six month one, 2018, which would have been between January and June, your lead consumer notice was due to the TCQ September 30th. If you have not submitted your documentation, but you did monitor during that period, we encourage you to get that to us as soon as possible. And it, uh, just a reminder, if you sampled during reduced monitoring 2018, which would have been through June through September. <laughs> uh, that lead consumer notice is due by December 31st, 2018. But y'all can don't have to wait until the last day. You can submit it to us now. And just an ongoing um, public service announcement that you know the TCEQ and the EPA is going to continue to encourage all public water systems to make information about lead in their system available to the public. And that's those are they're my updates. And if anybody has any questions, I will be here. Any questions for Jessica? Anything uh, by email yet? Oh, okay. Uh, well, Jessica, thank you very much for your important updates. Um, I, I just am hearing that uh, the our uh, receipt of emails is not functioning qu quite so well at this time, so we're not receiving any emails via the DWOG. Okay, so uh, we're not able to get those, your questions in real time. Uh, our apologies there. If you do have questions and you're viewing from the webcast, please do continue to submit your questions or comments. We will catch up eventually, uh, maybe later today after the meeting, but we sure want to hear from you. Uh, so don't hesitate to send in your questions or comments to the DWAG email at dwawg at tcq.texas.gov. Uh, so keep those coming, even though we're not able to get them in real time at, the, at this moment. Um, thanks again, Jessica. We're going to move on to updates from uh, Ms. Brittany uh, Wortham-Tekel, the team leader for the Drinking Water Quality Team. 
Good morning. Um, I first want to apologize for yawning so much. I'm so tired with this dreary weather. It has me really sleepy, so my apologies. Um, for, I just have a few uh, announcements to make. Um, I have two regulatory guidance documents that will be made available soon. Um, one for public water system guidance for monitoring, analyzing, and reporting chlorine dioxide and chlorite, and the other guidance for monitoring, analyzing, and reporting bromate. Um, next for surface water treatment rule, if you are currently using an SWMOR that does not have the pH data summary on the summary page, please contact us so we can provide an updated SWMOR for you. Um, we are definitely looking at that data, and I know that if you're hearing me in the supplies to we've probably already reached out to you to ask you to use the updated form, so I'm just sending a friendly reminder. Um, we've also developed a free chlorine conversion fact sheet in a suggested, not mandatory, public notice to help your public water system assist educate your customers in the event of a free chlorine conversion. Since we've had a lot of questions and concerns from consumers in the past several months and or years about the potential changes in taste and odor and the effects of the free chlorine conversion, we decided to gather a little bit of um, information to help you better streamline your notifications to your customers. Lastly, I do have some new staff and I apologize um, to two of my staff whom I thought were here during the last walks so or are not listed in the updates, but I have three new staff on my team. One is Emily Smith. She's a chemical compliance support. She is assisting Bonnie Evans with the disinfectant level quarterly operating reports and free chlorine conversion notifications. Um, Emily, if you wave. Hello. And then um, I have Christine Lafort, who's over there. She is a, a chemical compliance as well, working with disinfectant byproducts and operational valuation uh, level reports. Um, she's going to be working closely with Mia Gonzalez on that. So if you have any questions on those compliance programs, you can call Christine Lafort as well. And then Natalie Bello, who is um, chem chemical compliance support for inorganic and organic contaminant um, programs, and she's assisting in the lab approval process. So welcome to my three new staff. And that is it for drinking water quality. Great. Thank you, Brittany. Are there any questions for Brittany? We had a couple. Can you make those names available for us? The Which names of your new staff? Yes, um, I can. We can email a blog email. group. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay. Sure. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, Angel Bustamante, El Paso Water. Um, I wanted to ask, El Paso Water is a, a free chlorine system, and you were talking about this free chlorine conversion. Just wanted to confirm, is that is that a chlorine burn for the chloraminated systems? Correct. Okay. Does TCQ have any guidance, uh, maybe on their website, uh, for systems that want to do a free chlorine burn? I'm just curious. We, I don't know if we have any technical guidance on the procedures for the free chlorine conversion. Do, do we have that on the website? That would probably. Um, so, oh. <laughs> the green light turns on. Um, <laughs> So at this time, we do not. However, over the last year or so, um, the Texas Optimization Program responded to um, a handful of water systems that were having some um, issues rapidly doing uh, a free chlorine conversion. Um, you referred to that as a, as a burn. We're recommending that we use the term conversion because in some cases to the layperson, um, hearing that their water is being burned can be very concerning. So um, just uh, as an FYI, that's, that's why we're using that term. Um, and as a result of the assistance that was provided, we did put together a presentation in August at the Public Drinking Water Conference on that topic. So we had a 45-minute presentation on some recommendations for how to conduct a free chlorine conversion effectively. And now, as a follow-up, we're planning on taking that information f that was presented in the presentation and, and putting it in some type of written guidance document. At this time, we don't um, have a timeline for when that will be ready, um, but at some point in the future, we, we will have some guidance on that. Thanks. Thanks, Joel.
I do want to reiter uh, excuse me, reiterate that the, the guidance that Brittany's talking about, though, are a, uh, a template public notice if you are going to do a free chlorine conversion. Uh, so it's, it can be very helpful to, to communicate uh, with your customers about that. It's not required to do a notification, but we certainly encourage it. And this is a template that you can, uh, a system can use to do that. Uh, and then a group of frequently asked questions, correct, Brittany? Right? That's correct. It's a yeah. very short document that you know, can supplement your public notice um, for your customers. For a lot of the questions we received, we went ahead and preemptively answered them in that fact sheet. So we hope these are useful tools uh, for anyone, for any system that is, undergoes a free chlorine conversion, either uh, at some uh, prescribed frequency or even if they do it uh, as just an immediate corrective action for what they, they need to see fit for their water system. Uh, so those are out there and available, and we certainly uh, hope, uh, hope they're helpful. All right. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, we're going to move on to updates from the drinking water special function section. Uh, we're going to hear from the section manager, Ms. Michelle Risco. Thanks, Gary. Um, <clears throat> so special functions includes two teams, uh, the first one being inventory and that inventory and protection. So that's going to include inventory, surprise, surprise, all the data that is associated to your systems, as well as um, support documents such as uh, monitoring plans and emergency preparedness plans. Um, in light of the significant rain outside, um, the technical specialist in charge of emergency preparedness plans is uh, addressing some potential flooding in the Llano area, so she's not in this morning. I wanted to make some statements on her behalf. Um, first, if you operate any systems that are uh, EPP applicable, in other words, you are in Fort Bend or Harris County at this point in time, um, we have done a, a thorough review of that program and reached out to anyone who currently has a waiver, and we've requested you to submit documentation to ensure that the waiver is still a valid waiver. Um, we are still waiting for many of those to be received back by us. Um, if you are one of those systems or it may apply to you, please check to see whether um, you've received the request and if you have, um, take the opportunity to fulfill it. We've worked as, as um, streamlined as possible to give you a specific worksheet of the data we need in order to um, reevaluate that waiver. Additionally, um, anyone who has an emergency preparedness plan um, or is starting a new system in the Harris or Fort Bend area that will be needing an EPP, um, we have a new support staff um, who will be working with you, a Mr. Taylor, Taylor Nickel, um, as well as the um, senior uh, officer on that, which is Ms. Leticia De Leon. So if you have any questions about either of those documents or the waivers, please feel free to reach out to the, either of those staff. Their numbers, um, Leticia's number is in the um, notes for the DWOG. Um, additionally, uh, coming up, we have some training opportunities related to resiliency, vulnerability, risk mitigation, et cetera, to make sure people are more prepared for any incident that may come up in the future. I wanted to make you aware that there is a no-cost workshop coming up um, in Houston on November the 29th. It's from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., and it's called Tools and Techniques for Resiliency and Strategic Planning. It's specifically a workshop for small water systems, which many of our water systems are, and hopefully some of you have. Um, if you'd like additional information on that, please reach out to us and we can provide you the information. Um, it is also posted on the TRWA website and is a workshop put on by the EPA is on their website as well. Um, we also wanted to give you a heads up that TCEQ through our um, contractor, the um, CDM, we are going to be offering a similar workshop that will actually help you prepare your emergency response plan um, coming up in the Waco area in early December, as soon as we receive specific location and um, date information, we will uh, send that out through the DWOG link and have it available on the DWOG website. Does anyone have any questions about emergency preparedness or uh, Homeland Security at this point in time? Excellent. Um, also, one or more of the items that falls underneath uh, inventory is going to be the boil water notice as well as the public notice. I'm sure uh, Patrick will give you some updates on those. Just one thing I wanted to bring to everyone's attention is um, we are hoping to discuss um, in a stakeholder format um, the boil water notice and how it, uh, it and public notice are taking advantage of modern technology, reverse 911 alerts, um, electronic email alerts, those types of items. Um, and I will be reaching out to, I have already reached out to some, but I'll be reaching out to others to try and get an idea of how you're using technology um, and what recommendations we as the state can make and how perhaps we could um, help others communicate more readily with their, with their customers. Um, 
that being said, there's also the uh, technical review team, which uh, Mr. Jonathan Hayes runs, and that's going to be enforcement and um, data. Data is very, very important. Um, I did want to kind of put out there that um, we've made some upgrades and changes. Drinking Water Watch website was out momentarily um, for about two days as we transferred over servers, and it did not transfer very well. Um, so I do hope that you um, have been able to get up and running. If any of your links are not working, I would encourage you to do two things. First, clean out your cache or your cookies. Second, um, ensure that the web URL you're using includes HTTPS. The S means secure, which is the type of server we moved to. So any links you had that did not include the S will no longer work. Those are the highlights I have for you. And for right now, I'd like to pass it over to Mr. Jonathan Haynes to discuss his team specific items. Good morning. Um, so I just wanted to hit on a few highlights. Um, we're, we're continuing to work with EPA on moving over to the Compliance Monitoring Data Portal, or CMDP. It's, it's been a long process. Uh, we're, we've been having conversations with them. Um, hoping, hoping we'll get assigned a vendor. They have two vendors that they've uh, uh, contracted with in order to provide help to primacy agencies to make that transition. And uh, just a reminder, the, the CMDP is, is a new portal. Uh, well, it's not new now. It's been out about a year or so, um, but it's, it's new for us, a, a transition that we want to make. And so uh, for laboratories and water systems, that will be the way that we'll have samples, uh, operating reports come into the agency once we get that up and running. So as we have more information, we'll pass that along to you. I just wanted to let you know that we are in a conversation with EPA um, and trying to get assigned to a vendor, hopefully this quarter, uh, so that we can move forward on that into 2019. We do have a, a new contractor that we added for a district boundary, uh, boundary mapping. And uh, Stephen, I think you were back here. Stephen's waving his hand there. Um, Stephen Taylor uh, comes to us with quite a bit of G GIS experience. Uh, he's got a degree in that. And uh, so we've turned him loose on, on helping us catch up on a, on a bit of a backlog that we have on some district boundary mapping to get that current and keep up on it. On the E2 reporting, um, I, I did ask uh, both of our contractors who work on this, Lee Apostolo. Lee, can you raise your hand there? A lot of you may have talked with Lee in the past. Uh, Lee uh, is our principal contractor who works with that area. And then Dan Arnost is back here. He also uh, backs up Lee on that and, and can answer questions on that as well. So I asked him to come over today uh, at the break. If you have questions on any kind of laboratory E2 concerns, uh, uh, transfers that you need to, to uh, talk about, they can help you with that. And also, Dan uh, does lead and copper and some general chem uh, transfers as well, so uh, he can help you on any questions you have there. On the enforcement side of things, um, we've, we implemented a, a pre-enforcement coordinator position in Sally Paramo. Uh, it's one of our staff who, who agreed to work on that. And the idea is to reach out to systems who are on the brink of going into enforcement to try to help them get PNs in, uh, make sure they're doing their sampling, just kind of do a, a personal outreach to them. We've had some pretty good results with that. Uh, we're going to continue on with that program. And in fact, we're, we're in the process of expanding it to also include some post-enforcement uh, post work where we would work with systems that are already enforcement but have things that they need to do in order to get back into compliance. Uh, so Emma Jones has, has joined Sally for, the, for this quarter, and we'll be working on that. So. Well, we're very much trying to, to keep uh, as many enforcement cases out of enforcement as we possibly can. So if you have any questions on that, I'd be glad to talk to you about that. Um, the Consumer Confidence Report, uh, we're, we're in the process of, of getting compliance determinations completed, violations out the door, uh, probably here in the next month or two. We'll be wrapping that part of things up for this uh, previous year. We do have a new UTA contractor uh, on the CCR program, Consumer Confidence Report program. Uh, Nashanta Johnson Nishanta has, has joined us. Uh, we're very happy to have Nashanta. She worked for many years in Georgia in the public water program there, uh, working on CCR. So she brings that experience with her uh, here to Texas. So we're very happy to have her. So if you have any questions on CCR, Nashanta can hang around here through the break and, and answer questions. Uh, that's pretty much all the updates that I have. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Um, if there's no questions for Jonathan, then I send it off to Mr. Patrick Kidding, fresh back from Michigan. That's right, and uh, I feel like I never left with this weather, so it's, it's great. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a couple uh, things real quick here. Um, the first one uh, regarding public notice, um, 
We do have a, a fairly new website up that has all of the templates and uh, for the actual notice and then the certificate of deliveries for those uh, public notices. And uh, the, the best way to get to that site is if you just um, go to the TCQ webpage and in the search bar just uh, search for public notice. Um, it'll be one of the first links there. Um, and that will have, um, like I said, information on um, all of the different public notices and including uh, a boil water notice and it'll have the most uh, up-to-date uh, templates and certificates of delivery. Um, if you are uh, scrolling around on that page and um, see any or come up to any issues with any of the links, um, please do let us know. Um, the, the easiest way to uh, do that is just to send us an email to the public notice program, uh, which is pwspn at tcq.texas.gov. Um, Moving on to, uh, uh, we are two fees. Um, the PHS, the public health service invoices, are going to be going out next month. So uh, just a reminder on that. Um, and then with the, the other fee, uh, the regulatory assessment fee, a reminder that uh, we will not be sending out those worksheets. Um, uh, we will be sending out a postcard, a reminder postcard. Um, and and all reporting and payment for the regulatory assessment fee uh, should be done online. Um, it's a much uh, streamlined process for, um, for us and, and we hope for, for you all. So um, like I said, we will be sending out a reminder for the regulatory assessment fee, but the, the normal public health service invoices um, will be sent out next month. Um, any questions about fees? Um, I encourage you to to call our our main um, our our main phone number for the uh, division, which is uh, the five one two two three nine four six nine one, and um, ask to speak to somebody regarding fees. Uh, you can also send an email to our team mailbox at wu fees, which that's w u f e e s at tcq texas gov. Um, and uh, we can, uh, we'll get back an answer to you as, as quickly as we can. Uh, <clears throat> then I think at the last, uh, the last dog, I, um, I shared my uh, nerdiness about maps and my excitement about the new, a new map that was coming out. Well, that map is out now. Uh, it is the Source Water Assessment and Protection Viewer. Um, so basically what that, that mapping um, application has is all of the uh, sources of drinking water for all the public water systems throughout the state of Texas. Um, so it'll show uh, uh, the location of all the wells and surface water intakes. Um, so uh, once again, I think the easiest way to, to get to that is to uh, search for the source water assessment and protection viewer on the TCQ website. Um, and um, I, I encourage you to check it out and play around with it. Um, I think you'll find that a lot. It's, uh, it's much easier to use and has a lot more features than the, the past uh, version of that. And um, my last little update is uh, we are working on a, a, um, a specific website for groundwater under the influence um, systems and, and sources and kind of um, explaining the uh, our process for the determination of uh, if you are a GUI source, um, but then also uh, we're going to, going to be including some helpful step-by-step -step, um, processes to to help uh, systems that have been um, designated as a GUI system uh, to come into compliance. So um, hopefully we'll um, have that uh, live in in the next couple months, and um, I encourage you to. Uh, take a look at that when that's live, uh, especially if you are a GUI system. Uh, and that is all I have. So, any questions? All Thank right. you, Patrick. Um, two small things that I also just wanted to bring to everyone's attention. Um, in the process of um, being prepared, should anything happen at any time, we are trying to maintain a up-to-date 
emergency contact list for every public water system. As part of that, we send out emergency contact update forms, and the first set of those, they're done by region to make sure we're not overwhelming anyone at the same time, um, are being sent out this coming week. So if you receive an emergency contact update form, please return that. Um, there are instructions on, on it and all that kind of information. Um, they'll be coming back to either the PWS InVem box or um, through uh, the snail mail to Leticia de Leon. Um, the only other item I had is part of the protection and drinking water inventory and protection also includes the sor source water protection program that Mr. Mason Miller um, has been handling for years. Um, we did have a um, system voluntarily come forward this year from a surface water source um, that in the process of doing that we're going to not only protect them but also four or five other public water systems in their area because they have a shared source. Um, historically, this has been a completely voluntary program, and a lot of the uh, volunteers have been groundwater sources. I would like to encourage you that if you are a groundwater source and would like to participate in this program, or if you're a surface water um, user and uh, would like to see what we can do for you, please reach out to Mr. Mason Miller, um, and we can try to get you into our program in the future. Um, we'd like to keep making sure that uh, potential sources of contamination are identified and the future source water of Texas is protected. That's all I have. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Michelle, Jonathan, and Patrick for all your important updates. Uh, any questions for, for anyone on the panel? That concludes our updates. just want to ask if there's any questions before we take a little break, and then we're going to move into our presentations. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining with us. We're going to take a little break uh, on a rainy day. Sorry, we could stretch and yawn if you need to. Um, it's 10.01. We're going to come right back at 10, 10.10, 10, 10, 10, 11, pretty much on the dot and get started with our presentation. So we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you. There are restrooms right outside the door. Uh, there's restrooms on the first floor as well. Okay, all this is 
Check, check. Yeah, it's still dry. Yeah, it's still dry. Yeah, it's just. Morning. Maybe because of the gold. So you've been doing the level two. 
Okay, I have uh, 12 after 10. We're going to get rolling back with our presentations. Again, we certainly always welcome uh, remote viewers via uh, the webcasts. Uh, so thank you all uh, if you're tuning in today. We've been in and out on being able to be interactive via email, but please continue to send your questions or comments uh, to our DWAG email address. That's D W A W G at tceq.texas, spelled out, dot gov, G-O-V. Uh, if we cannot answer them in real time or through the course of the meeting today, we will guaranteed follow back up and, and respond to your questions and comments if you've emailed those in. We certainly encourage participation, and as well as for the folks here in the room, uh, we, we always want this to be an informal gathering. Uh, your participation in this is critical, and we certainly value your feedback and questions and discussion. So we're going to get into our presentations. Um, all three presentations today emanate from our drinking water assessment team and the drinking water standards section. We're going to have two, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have a correction on that. One of, one of the presentations uh, comes from, from the um, uh, response and capacity development team regarding level twos for RTCR. Uh, the RTCR for uh, Level 1s, Level 2s has been a collaborative project between the Drinking Water Standards section and the Plan and Technical Review section. So I, I apologize my mistake there. Um, but we have three presentations in total coming up. Two are, are, two are focused on the RTCR, Level 1 and Level 2 assessments, as well as sample siting plans. And then we're going to hear um, some updates regarding the groundwater rule. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it, I believe, to uh, Alex Hins and Casey Stinson regarding uh, the revised total coliform rule level one assessments and sample siting plan best practices and lessons learned. All right. Thank you, Gary. Uh, my name is Alexander Hins. I've, I've worked here at the TCEQ for a little while, and I'm going to go ahead and talk, talk about level one assessments, sort of lessons learned. I joined the revised total coliform rule program November 1st, so it's been almost a year, and then Casey Stenson's gonna, gonna talk about the sample siding plans. So, what is the purpose of a level one assessment? Obviously, if you get too many total coliform positive samples in distribution, that can lead to triggering a level one assessment. That's gonna be based on the number of samples collected, whether you're less than 40 per month or greater. But really what a level one assessment is, the, the goal of the assessment is to, to try and identify sanitary defects or defects in distribution system coliform monitoring practices, and then ideally, why did you trigger the level one assessment, i.e., why, why are you getting these positive samples? 
So the whole basis of these assessments is to identify sanitary defects. So to me, this is a very, very important definition. Usually I try not to read verbatim, but I always read this one verbatim, so please bear with me. But a sanitary defect is defined as a defect that could provide a pathway of entry for microbial contamination into the distribution system, for example, a water distribution line leak, or that is indicative of a failure or imminent failure in a barrier that is already in place. Let's say if the chlorinator fails and you don't have disinfection in your distribution system, that's a failure of a barrier. Um, vent screens also, whether it's on your ground storage tank, elevated, clear well, or your well, that can be a pathway and a breakdown in a barrier if the screen's missing. So just to give you all a little perspective and several examples. So for the level one assessment, it's actually 12 pages and it has seven sections of questions. It's gonna start with the sample site, uh, you know, then sources, distribution, so on and so forth. And so it's, it's important that there's, there's two required attachments with the level one assessment. So there's, you know, sometimes we don't get all the required attachments, which obviously kind of slows down the process, obviously would not get deemed adequate. Um, and so the first attachment is a coliform sample collection standard operating procedure. So this is going to be ideally a written document that an operator can use that talks about how the actual sample is collected. Now the sample siting plan tells you where to collect it. This is gonna talk about how to actually collect the sample. A lot of times it's gonna start with sample site selection, make sure the sample taps 18 inches above ground level, for example, uh, that it's not leaking, that it's facing downward. Then it'll go into you know, sample, sample preparation, flush the line for two to five minutes until you get a residual, uh, disinfect the tap, so on and so forth. And so this is something that, that, that is required to be submitted with the level one assessment. So the second attachment is 30 days of disinfectant residual data from the distribution system. So depending on how many connections you serve, if you're 250 or more, it's gonna be you're collecting residuals from distribution daily. If you're less than 250 connections, it's gonna be once every seven days. So essentially, whenever you trigger that level one assessment, go from that date back 30 days and submit those residuals to us. We just really we're, we're looking through that data just to see if there's, there's any patterns or residuals that are below the minimum. Because if you have residuals that are below the minimum, that's always going to be a sanitary defect, thus requiring corrective action. <clears throat> so after reviewing, I don't know. 100 or so, 150 of these level one assessments. So I think we get, Casey, what was it? 170 to 180 per year yeah. along those lines. They don't stop coming in, by the way. So uh, job security, I guess. Um, but one thing I've sort of learned about this is some of the questions are kind of lengthy. There's probably 60 or 70 questions on the entire form. Read the questions carefully. Um, Sometimes they get interpreted the opposite, and so when they mark it that way, they're sort of indicating that there's potentially a problem or a sanitary defect, and indeed there really wasn't. And so when we do get questions that get, get mismarked, we're going to communicate with the system and usually follow up with an email to, to get clarification. So uh, answer all the applicable questions. Yes and no is, is uh, an answer for every question, and, and the majority of them have a not applicable. Um, so you don't wanna leave questions just completely blank. If it doesn't apply to you, just check, check not applicable. Um, if you answer a question in a certain way that indicates there may be a problem or a sanitary defect, go ahead and provide a written description or supporting documentation for that. There's, there's a lot of times where for example, it asks a question, did you have any residuals below 0 0.23 or 0 0.5 total in the distribution system? And if they mark yes, then didn't provide one of the required attachments, which was their disinfectant residuals, obviously that's, that's kind of an issue. Um, so again, if you indicate that there might be a problem, go ahead and provide a, a, a written description of that. If you need to you know, provide additional pages to provide those explanations, please do so. Um, and most importantly, uh, on page eight of the level one assessment form, we're gonna ask who the level one assessor is. So that's whoever at the public water system actually conducted that assessment. 
Um, make sure their information is completed on there, and then also the PWS representative, their information, and the form needs to be signed and dated. A lot of times I'll see, uh, you know, it, it's not signed or dated or, or missing one of those two bits of information. <clears throat> So when, you, <clears throat> when a level one assessment is triggered, the system will be notified by email, uh, ideally by, by the revised total color form rule group, and the system will have 30 days to complete that assessment and then get it turned back in to TCEQ. And so if you do identify sanitary defects that are easily correctable, um, make sure that documentation is submitted with the level one assessment form if you're able to get that corrected before you submit that form back to TCEQ, which again is 30 days. Um, and so documentation could, could consist of photographs, receipts, invoices, work orders, uh, for example. And be prepared uh, to provide written clarification to TCEQ staff when requested, because there's not too many level one assessments when you're thinking 60 to 70 questions, two re required attachments, then I'm usually not going to at least have one or two questions on certain points that may need clarification. So just keep in mind that there's a, the majority of these do require, you know, a phone call and then some email correspondence with the system to seek clarification. And so, uh, again, just be prepared, prepared to hear from TCEQ on the level one assessment. <clears throat> So a lot of information that I see being submitted with the, the level one assessments that are not necessarily uh, uh, needed is the system sample siting plan. Because when we ask for that sample collection, SOP, the coliform sample collection SOP, a lot of folks get that confused with the sample siting plan because the sample siting plan does have several SOP components to it. So I, th I think the folks get confused, so instead of submitting that coliform collection SOP, they're submitting that sample siting plan in lieu of that. And I, instead of systems submitting the 30 days of disinfectant residuals, I get quite a few my, microbial reporting forms, which normally we're going to have the majority of that information, so it, it's really not necessary. Now, again, if this is specifically requested by TCEQ after submittal, then, then of course go ahead and submit that, but uh, I see a lot of that information coming in that's, that's just not necessary. <clears throat> so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead, I'll switch places with you. Uh, my mic is working just fine if you just pass me the clicker. Okay. Uh, morning everybody, my name is Casey Stinson. Um, I am going to do my best uh, Lillian Johnson impression because she specializes in the sample siting plans. <laughs> Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, Alex mentioned uh, the coliform sampling SOP. We actually have worked together here uh, to develop one that we feel like is uh, very good and all-inclusive covering um, sourcing the bottles, storing the bottles, um, prepping the site, collecting the sample, and transporting to the labs. So we do have that at our disposal. If any of y'all are interested, just reach out to us and we'd be happy to provide that template to you all. Um, and it's a Word document that you all can uh, feel free to implement at your system. So rolling into the um, sample siting plans, these are required for all public water systems. Um, the sample siting plans are subject to state review. Um, if you haven't submitted yet, make sure you get it in um, soon because they are past due. Um, additionally, if you all are making any adjustments, um, obviously things change in your system on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're needing to put in a new routine sample site, um, do so. Make sure it's equally representative and then submit the revised sample siting plan to us and you'll basically uh, be working under interim approval. Um, we will review those. If we have an issue, we'll reach out. But as long as you have submitted an updated one to us, you are okay to go ahead and start using those sites. Again, make sure it's equally representative. If you have any questions about that, reach out to us before you finalize it. Um, and as y'all can see, this is the group email box where you can submit all of these to. And uh, our whole team has access to it. All right. 
So the sample siting plan has um, some minimum requirements. The sample siting plan must identify all routine uh, sample sites. You can list extras above what you collect on a month-to-month -month basis. That way, if you um, need to change a site on the fly, you don't have to do a revision. You already have a spare site available. Um, also, the repeat uh, coliform sites have to be listed as well as a sample collection schedule, how you're collecting it on a, a monthly basis. Um, also list all the groundwater wells um, to ensure that uh, you're in compliance with the groundwater rule. And also a distribution map must be required, and I'll go into the requirements for that uh, shortly. So um, the sample siting plan template is actually available on our website. Um, it is a PDF fillable form and uh, as um, my team lead mentioned, uh, make sure you use an Internet Explorer. Or you may have some issues um, getting, it, getting it downloaded. The good thing about the PDF form is you can pull it up, save a file on your computer, and um, make revisions as necessary. All right, so when you're actually listing your sample locations, you want to make sure you list all of your original routine sample locations and at least one upstream and downstream repeat. Um, since these aren't sites that you sample normally, I would recommend listing multiple upstream and downstream options. That way, if you're unable to get uh, in touch with that next door neighbor whenever you're trying to collect a repeat, you have another site already listed, ready to be pulled. You don't have to delay collecting your uh, repeat samples. All right, um, so here are some of the requirements for that distribution map that, again, is required. Um, all the original routine coliform sites do have to be listed on there. Um, make sure you're listing the distribution mains and their sizes, um, entry point uh, locations as well, and then any pressure plane boundaries or water storage facilities that you all have. Um, and again, if it only has one pressure plane uh, or no water storage, just, just make a note of that so we don't think that it's been left out. Um, and this is our contact information. If you all have any questions uh, regarding anything to do with the revised total coliform rule, sample siting plans, assessments, feel free to reach out to either Alex or myself and we'll be happy to help. And as always, uh, financial, managerial, and technical assistance is available. Um, if you have any, any need for that, feel free to reach out to us. We can request it on your behalf. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have plenty of time, so if there's questions for uh, Alex or Casey. Alex, just one kind of detailed question. It's the level one assessment, that can be signed by anyone in the utility staff that has knowledge of that assessment being done, correct? Or, or not? Yeah, usually, ideally how it would work is the person actually conducting the assessment would be a licensed operator that's familiar with the system, and then the PWS representative would usually be some type of supervisor or general manager something along those lines. You're talking about two signatures or one? Well, you have to list, the signature is the PWS representative, so there's only one signature. But that's kind of how I view, uh, how I like to see that in terms of who conducts the assessment and then sort of who signs off on it as the PWS representative. Sometimes you could, the assessor and the PWS rep could be one and the same, the, you know, sometimes the utility director. They don't necessarily be, a, do they need to be a licensed operator to sign that form? No. Okay. They do Thank not. You. I got uh, two questions or comments. Um, number one, for our repeat sample sites, we use the SOP to denote how we collect repeat samples upstream and downstream within five connections and the original. And then the second part, I, I guess my comment or question, is we have um, a distribution map, which is solely the distribution map that indicates um, all our you know, flushing points, water mains, and water main sizes. When we have that kind of information, because we acquire some systems that we, you know, we had issues getting the original documentation of what was actually in the ground. 
but as we replace lines and all that, we start indicating that in that map. Um, for the sample siting plan, um, we usually just indicate the sample sites, um, our RTCR um, routine sample sites, and then like where the plant is. Um, and that's pretty much, and then we just have the outlines of our lines of where, where they lay um, on that map for that. Is that, is that okay or? Um, as far as the actual layout and everything goes, I understand there are going to be some limitations on what you guys know uh, about new systems you've acquired, um, main sizes and all of that, if you have it provided. Okay. Since we did finish up a little bit early, I'm gonna to touch on two more important points about the level one assessments, if that's all right with y'all. Um, level one assessments, when triggered, are not violations. Um, identifying sanitary defects uh, are not violations either. Um, and then that segues into the point about when you identify a sanitary defect, as Alex said, it does not have to be fixed before you submit your assessment. Don't miss the deadline trying to fix a sanitary defect. Just make a note on the submitted level one assessment form about when the repair will be completed. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Um, can you share with a group, uh, based on some of the assessments that you've gotten back from public water systems, any, any tips on uh, resiliency, how to make your system more robust, how to prevent sanitary defect pathways, anything enlightening that you can share with us? Um, yes, and I'm not trying to be cynical, but this is, it's not a desktop exercise that should be completed in the office. It's something where you should actually go out and take a look at your system. I know if it's a really large system, that, that can be fairly cumbersome, but that, that's really the point is to physically go out there. Go to the actual sample sites. Take a look at it. We've gone out on numerous level one assessments um, and level two assessments for that matter, and a lot of times we go to those sample sites and we see quite a few issues with those actual sample sites. I saw one where th there's a lot of... Uh, vegetation that that's awfully c close to the sample site. I saw a dryer vent within I don't know four to six inches of the sample site. Um, th things of that nature. But taking it seriously, physically getting out there, looking at your system, um, you know, going through your maintenance procedures. I, I think is is pretty important too. If you have, you know, you're fixing a water line leak and you're not just going to stick a clamp on it and do it under pressure, where you're actually going to have to isolate everything, potentially cut into it, dewater it. Um, you want to make sure that they're following the AWWA standards because that, that's uh, an obvious pathway for microbial contamination when you open up the distribution system. And so that barrier is the AWWA standards in terms of, of disinfection. Um, focus on your, your ground storage tanks. Make sure that that all your vent screens are, are properly in place. There's not holes in them, they're not missing. And you know the overflow flaps. To me, those are the two main avenues for microbial contamination on a ground storage tank. And um, like I said, just getting out there, doing those evaluations, um, obviously making sure that treatment is always being maintained um, in terms of the minimum disinfectant residuals, whether you're on free chlorine or chloramines. And um, if you're on chloramines, going through those conversions, I know there was a question on that earlier, there's a lot of systems that really, really struggle out there. And um, having a nitrification action plan, when you go through a conversion, it's not really just turning off the ammonia and not doing any flushing. We've seen that happen. And so you really, when you go through those conversions, there's a lot of recommended steps that need to be done or you can really, end up with some issues out in di distribution, whether it's coliform positive samples, um, taste and odor, actually not having any residual. If you get right at breakpoint chlorination, you may not have any residual at all until you build that free residual out in distribution. So there can be a myriad of issues you, you can run into. But in terms of the level one assessment, um, taking it seriously and actually getting out there and physically looking at all this stuff, um, you know, it seems like uh, a lot of systems 
point to the operator and, and the sample collection, and that may or may not be the case. I'm not most of the time physically out there taking a look at that, um, but that's what I see mostly reported is we took it on a you know windy or rainy day the operator didn't follow the sample collection sop and i'm not seeing very many actual sanitary defects reported on the level one assessment which differs greatly from the level two assessment that i believe charlie middleton's going to get into here shortly but really just getting out there and trying to find those sanitary defects um, because you have an opportunity at the level one assessment level to find it and correct it. Um, if you don't note anything, you trigger another level one assessment within a rolling 12 month period, that could very easily and more than likely <clears throat> will be upgraded to a level two assessment where you're gonna have a representative from TCEQ come out and, and go on site and go through the level two assessment. So the level one sort of, hey, let me go out and look and see if I can find these problems. If I can find them and get them corrected, maybe I won't continue to have these positive samples and I won't trigger a level two assessment. Thanks, thanks, Alex. That was the long version. <laughs> yeah, to, to build off of what Alex was saying, the, the best part about the level one assessment is it really goes through step by step every place that could either cause contamination of your sample or actual sanitary defects in your distribution system and things break down over time. So with this form, you don't just have to use it for level one assessments. That's something you could do for preventative maintenance. Go through the form and check once a year, twice a year. That way you never get the positives, you never actually trigger it, you can catch it before things go sideways. Thank you. Good questions, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Alex and Casey. Much appreciated. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, hear from Charles Middleton um, with the Plan and Technical Review section regarding uh, revised total coliform rule level two assessment best practices and lessons learned. Thank you, Charlie. We had an email question. I had one question from email. Um, if a revision is made to the sample siting plan, is it, is it required to submit the entire document or just the revisions? Good. Um, for that, go ahead and submit the, uh, the whole document, the whole revised document, and we will save that new copy. Any other questions, John? Okay, great, thank you. Charlie, whenever you're ready. Turn my mic on, okay, sorry. My name is Charlie Middleton. I'm with the, the Texas Optimization Program as part of the, the Response and Capacity Development Team. Can everyone hear me okay? Because uh, let me know if I get a bit too quiet. Um, so today I'm going to be covering lessons learned from level two assessments under the, uh, the RTCR. Um, hopefully there won't be too much overlap from the level ones, maybe a little bit with the, the sample siting plans. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different because we're with the level twos, systems that are triggered those get, get assistance from us. So. It's not going to be concentrating so much on the contents of, of the form, but really the, the issues we're seeing while providing that assistance. Um, so I know the, the RTCR rule of the RTCR is not brand new anymore, but it's still relatively new. So just to, to clarify when level two is going to be triggered, it's going to be if you have a, an E. coli MCL. So that's going to be you know in a routine repeat sample set, a combination of an E. coli and a total coliform positive sample in either order, uh, or an E. coli with no repeats collected, um, or a positive repeat where there's been no further E. coli analysis. Um, you could also trigger by having two level ones in a rolling 12 month period, um, unless after your first level one, you, you identified the issue that caused it, uh, fixed it, and provided us with, with documentation, in which case that second level one would be another level one. Um, 
So obviously for, for some people, the, this rule is relatively complex. Um, with the people we're visiting for level twos, um, a lot of them are smaller systems with populations under 10,000. It could be anything from, it could be community, non-transient, non-community, or transient. So we're going to encounter a, probably a wide range of, of operator knowledge there. Um, and some people are going to need, need a lot more help than others. Um, I'll start off with areas where we found people have needed help or have had shortcomings in their program, uh, especially in, in the paperwork area. Um, the first would be uh, sample siting plans, which I know have already been covered in, in level ones, but there's a an example of the distribution map there. I'm not sure you'll be able to see it, but you know it's including storage facilities, distribution sample sites covering you know, low, medium, and high water age uh, distribution lines, the service area. If there are multiple pressure planes, then we need to see the boundaries for, for those planes. Um, quite often, that's uh, there's at least something something missing from those maps. Um, the siting plan is also part of the the monitoring plan, which is a requirement for everyone, uh, and there may be similar issues there in terms of listing your disinfectant residual locations. Um, beyond those two, in terms of the, the office reviews of the forms we've received, there are, we're noticing sort of three big areas that a lot of people have issues, and if they're chloraminating, that would be nitrification action plans not being adequate. Um, and then the next two would be uh, cross-connection control program issues and uh, dead end main flushing problems. So we were asking people when you have a, a positive to really consider you know, backflow as is an issue with, with the cross-connection control program. Um, a lot of backflow events or the majority of backflow events go unnoticed and unrecorded. Um, so we really want people to be looking for, for backflow hazards in the immediate area where, where they're having positive samples. Um, and really trying to, you know, identify identify sites that, that may need protection. Make sure that's in place and it's being tested and it's functioning correctly. Um, similarly, with with dead end main flushing, um, a lot of a lot of people have a flushing program, but they may not have identified all their dead end mains. Uh, they may not be be flushing at the required, you know, at least monthly interval. Um, if they have a, a system which is more of a loop. Um, they may not be valving it off correctly to, to create dead ends while they flush, and they may be you know, circulating old water without really removing it. Um, and moving on to errors that have been seen while providing assistance you know, in the field, looking at, at people's sampling technique, um, we're seeing quite a lot of issues with, with sampling residuals. Um, so you need to make sure you're using the correct sample cells, the right instrument settings, the, the correct reagents and sample volumes. Um, I think we've seen all these errors in, in every possible combination, but obviously there's different sample cells for low range and high range tests, which is shown there. Um, Going to be specific reagent packets for low range, high range, and a total of free chlorine. Um, and your, your instrument should be should be verified against a standard which, which hasn't expired. Um, you know, you may also, depending on the instrument, have to align the sample cell correctly if it's capable of running different tests at, at, at different spots in, in the colorimeter. Um, beyond that, with residuals, uh, one of the issues we're seeing is that if people are, are running a test and it's over range, so you either get you know, the, the greater than symbol or, or a flashing readout. Um, frequently, people are just recording that top of the range as their result, and then they're, they're making treatment decisions based on inaccurate data or, or unknown values. So when you're asking people if, if you record a value over range to dilute that sample and you keep running that test again until you can actually determine what your, your concentrations really are. Um, I know this has been covered in numerous uh, PDW conference presentations, but um, in terms of positive samples, um, they're very rarely due to 
sampler or operator error. Um, the issues we're seeing have been from you know poor choices of sample sites, say kitchen faucets which can't be disinfected adequately, or people sampling downstream of a softener or a cartridge filter which may not have been maintained properly. Uh, we've also seen seen wells with failed failed chlorinators that that have uh, coliform positive water where they continue to run and, and resend that water throughout their system. Uh, and people, after losing pressure, who aren't really going through all their required steps to, to bring that area back into service, you know, they're, they're not flushing, they're not taking their special samples you know, in numerous locations throughout um, their distribution system bef before they're, they're collecting more routine samples. I know we have a, a flow chart, I think it's in 290.47E, which really highlights what, what you need to do. Um, of the assessments the, that the top team has conducted, we have found one example of operator error. Um, that individual wasn't following a sample site disinfection protocol. Um, I think it wasn't a visit I was on, but the note, the, the summary said that they weren't practicing minimal levels of personal hygiene, and they were also leaving uh, samples at room temperature for extended periods before sending them to the labs. But um, as far as I know, that's happened one time since we started these assessments. Okay, I'll cover some more of the kind of the training aspect or our assistance uh, to systems. So when an assessment is triggered, uh, someone from the TCQ or, or one of our approved contractors Will, will provide training to the water systems appointed assessor. And that's, that's a one day course on how to conduct the level two. Uh, you'll review all the questions through the form with that individual uh, who will hopefully, depending on the size of the system, be able, be able to visit the facilities and, and sample sites uh, that that system has. So what that means is that the assistance provider is going to complete the form with the water system assessor. Um, so they should get get to see, you know, a, a complete form that covers everything they need um, and have had the opportunity to, to go through that step at a time with the assistance provider. Um, we will get a form from our contractor sent to central office. However, the system needs to send their copy to us as well. You, you cannot use the assistance provider's copy as yours, so we will not consider it to have been received until we have a copy with the water system assessor's signature on it. So despite the fact that happens, um, and you should in theory, be getting two very similar documents. Um, in, in practice, um, the copies that we're receiving sometimes from the systems are inadequate in comparison to the, the assistance provider or the TCEQ employee's form. However, the fact that we have that form from our employee or, or contractor means that we can really revise the system's form to come up with a complete assessment. Um, the implications for the, the training requirements are that it appears that the one day may not be enough time for most people to really become competent at, at providing these assessments. Uh, the TCEQ contractors and employees have a, a multi-event training uh, before they can start providing this assistance, so it may not be, one day may not be sufficient for most people. After we've received your form, uh, they'll be reviewed at, at central office and we'll come up with a corrective action report and plan or CARP. Um, the list of CARP items will only include sanitary defects and this may mean a change uh, for your form from, from the form you've submitted to us. So the CARP items will have deadlines for required actions, but really they are those issues that have been identified as sanitary defects. Um, so there may be other deficiencies that have been found 
which will be list listed under best practices. They'll, these may still have requirements and recommendations for things that need to be changed. They may also be things that you can still be cited for or, or receive a violation for. But uh, looking back at that sanitary defect definition that we saw in the, the level one of being a, you know, a direct pathway for microbial contamination, um, everything that goes in that corrective action report list um, has to be seen as a sanitary defect. And the, uh, the RTCR team, have a, they've compiled a list of items that we consider to be sanitary defects. So uh, when your form is submitted, everything that is on there, that is on that list from the RTCR team, will be entered as a corrective action. Other items will be listed under best practices. Um, that doesn't mean they should be ignored. Uh, one thing we have noticed in the last year is that there's been a, an increase in the number of level two assessments that have required uh, top team assistance. So uh, the top team uh, uh, went out on 23 visits in 2017 and up uh, to 42 so far in 2018. Um, after reviewing this, there was, there was no area-wide or statewide change in bacteriological water quality. It's more been increased scrutiny of people collecting their repeats after an E. coli positive outside of 24 hours. Um, so I think we're being stricter with people collecting their repeats late or not collecting them at all. Uh, one other issue we've seen is uh, keeping us updated with changes to your inventory and changes to your facilities. Um, Initial inventory updates are often not correctly reported to TCEQ, and we often see discrepancies between what needs to be assessed and what's in existing sampling plans. So people are frequently changing facilities, adding entry points, adding pressure planes, and, and, and we haven't been informed. The, the assistance visit provides an opportunity to, to update the paperwork on site, your sample siting plans, your, your monitoring plans, your nitrification action plans. But if you're making changes uh, to your plants or your distribution systems, you do need to inform the TCEQ and you do need to inform our inventory team. And, uh, finally, heading back to the, the training aspect of the, our assistance visits um, and who can conduct these assessments. Uh, members of the optimization program uh, can con conduct these, these assistance visits and approve contractors. We're really using one main contractor and there may be one other who, who provides training uh, to our staff. Um, in theory, once, us, uh, once the assessor from a water system has been trained by a TCQ employee, um, they should be competent to conduct these assessments themselves. Um, however, if you've gone through this whole level two process to find and fix any issues you have, and then you trigger a second one, it suggests that actually you probably didn't do the first one properly. So if you do trigger a second one, then that PWS assessor, um, they can't conduct the assessment themselves, and the TCEQ will in fact come back and, and conduct the assessment themselves in the role of assessor rather than in an assistance capacity. So, so that's the end of the, the level two update. Um, I know for some of the main issues that we highlighted with the nitrification action plans, chloramination and cross-connection control program issues, we have uh, FMT directed assistance modules for those if anyone is interested uh, or would like that assistance. Um, does anyone have any questions? Great, thank you, Charlie. Any questions for Charlie? We have one right here. Are y'all gonna provide, um, you know, prior to, I guess, getting or triggering a level two assessment, are you gonna provide training for those individuals or companies that are wanting to, to get that training to be a level two assessor? I think long term, oh, yeah, I, I think long term that we may be broadening who's allowed to do the, the assessments, but at the moment, um, it's just that limited 
TCQ staff and those couple of contractors uh, for the time being. Yeah, well, Keith, I'll, I'll add on to that. I mean, that is something we're, we're looking into for sure. Um, we have a good plan right now. So far, we've been able to keep up with with the plan as Charlie's laid it out. Um, and we haven't, I haven't really received any specific requests. Um, I, I don't believe Joel's group has either, but that is something we want to look at. You know, the rules do specify specifically who can conduct an assessment, and the way we've done the level twos from, from April 1, 2016 has been, has always been the oversight um, or accompaniment by a TCQ or TCQ representative. And so that's, that's where we're at right now still. Um, uh, but that is something we're looking towards down the road. Any other questions for, for Charlie or, or about this topic? Yeah, I have one. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question here. Um, is level two assessment training only done on site during a level two assessment? I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah it's just going to be if you trigger a level two um, and we send someone out to con conduct the assessment with you. Now that we've heard about level ones and level twos, I did want to just reiterate that um, staff on in Jessica's RTCR team uh, have been working, um, following up every single positive with outreach to, to the system. So uh, what's critical, as Charlie mentioned, there was an uptick in level twos. Um, what we're seeing is, and, and granted, most of this is at, at, at smaller systems that have fewer resources, but there is a lack of understanding uh, of going out and immediately getting those repeats following an E. coli or a TC positive sample. And that has to be done within 24 hours. If you're not able to do it within 24 hours, you need to ask for, for permission from us. Uh, we have that conversation with you. Uh, but what we're doing is we're trying to immediately jump on uh, the phone with the water system that gets the positive as quickly as we receive that information to educate them about exactly what they need to do uh, regarding collection of repeats. Um, and that gives the opportunity to ask questions again, to reiterate the upstream downstream nature of the repeats, exactly where they're collecting those, exactly when they have to get those submitted to their lab, um, that we need to hear about those results so we understand if they trigger level one or, or even more importantly, level two. Uh, or if they have an e actual E. coli maximum containment level situation, which is a violation and requires a bowl of water. Um, so just we are doing our very best um, to, uh, to constantly provide that education as positive results come in um, throughout, throughout uh, the day. But again, if you, do, if you get a positive and you don't sample within 24 hours and you haven't been uh, granted permission to extend that repeat sample time, uh, that could trigger either a level one or, or a level two assessment. Gary, Charlie Maddox, Austin Water. Charlie, I guess I'm a little slow on this training part and who can do it and who can't, because you mentioned a one day crash course, and then I'm hearing that you've done all the assessments so far, either with TCQ staff or the contractor. There's gonna be some training, I guess, at some point for PWS staff, but am I misunderstanding that if you, let's say I have a level two assessment, you know, I hit that trigger, do you come out with a contractor or somebody and come in and one day and say, I want to train you on doing this level two, now you go do it and you submit the form, or does it not work that way? So, so the one day crash course is the, the TCQ employee or the contractor coming out to work with the PWS assessor once they've triggered a okay. level two. Um, so and then that person is qualified to do it, to do that one then? Is deemed qualified to do that level two? That, that contractor or TCQ employee is, is deemed competent to do that and they will train the PWS assessor in the process of going through the form. Um, however, after that one day event, if that system <coughs> triggers another, at this point, that PWS assessor can't then do the next level two on their own. Got it, I got it. Let's say you don't trigger another one. You okay. just got one level two. You can have TCQ contractor or TCQ come out and train me. And then I am then qualified or adequate or in your eyes approved to then go off and do the level two for Austin Water. 
or not? No, I, uh, no. I'll jump in. <laughs> That's not the way we have done this, Charlie. Okay. No, uh, it has been that. Um, and Charlie, please add on if I'm getting any, or if, you, if I'm leaving anything out. But the way we have done it is that if it's the first time you're getting the training, but and you're over and you're being accompanied by either a TCQ employee or one of our contractors. Um, you're doing it side by side. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. Got it. Right. But that doesn't qualify that that utility in your case. That wouldn't qualify y'all to now go and do other level two assessments on your own. <laughs> hopefully I never have to do any <laughs> hopefully I don't ever get there right but and the, distinct, the, there, the distinction yeah, Charlie's making it. is okay. if it's second level two is triggered yeah. which would be a pretty serious situation exactly um, I, I think it's been very few that we've seen yeah have you ever had any of those we have, have you? Uh, yeah. I think it's been I, I know of at least two yeah. two situations that may be it um, that but if that were the case a yeah. second level two is triggered yeah uh, that's where Charlie has made the distinction that actual TCQ is going to go in and do the assessment. All right. So we ju you just got one level two, and that's all you have. You haven't triggered a second one. Then you're doing it side by side with TCQ or contractor with, with PWS staff, and you're doing that assessment, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Got yes, it. sir. Thanks. Exactly. I guess to piggyback on what Charlie was talking about, on our, on our situation is different. We own a bunch and operate a bunch of water systems across Texas. So we trigger our level one or level two, um, you know, and we, we were trained, we'd be able to go out and do that if we had the qualified capabilities of getting this training for a level two. So it'd be a little different in, in that situation. It wouldn't be the same water system causing a level two. Um, so, you know, it would be a huge benefit for us to be able to have that training if, if possible. So okay. if I can, you know, let you know that we would really be interested in having that uh, qualification. Certainly appreciate that feedback. And, and I, we could see in a situation such as yours that that would be uh, an avenue to, to explore. Um, so far, this has been working. This has been working really well. Um, but we know that down the road, there could be some circumstances where uh, a, a party or a group is seeking out to get their own certification to be an assessor. Um, but this is where we're at right now. This is an agreement we've made with EPA on how we're doing these. Uh, and so, so far, things are working well, but we certainly value your feedback and input. And we are looking at that. We are looking at trying to establish the best way to get that done where, where we could uh, uh, have a, a system for uh, certifying or somehow approving a third-party assessor. We're not there yet, uh, but that is something we're looking at. Good morning, everybody. I'm Carrie Michelle Kyle. I'm the director of water supply, and I just wanted to talk to you about kind of where we're at with that because we're having some discussions with uh, operator licensing to figure out whether that certification can come through on the operator licensing side, whether or not tests can be modified to include questions that are at a level where everyone's feeling comfortable that these level two assessments can get done. I think a lot of stakeholder feedback that we've been getting is that these are pretty complicated and, and above what a normal operator has to do. And so our first concern is making sure that we're providing enough assistance to everyone to figure this out. We're also, you know, this has been a learning opportunity for us as we get out on site and walk with people through these issues that we're seeing the complexity of the form and maybe making this easier. So it's a pilot program for us too. And certainly, you know, this is a great forum for us to have a discussion about some things that you could see. I know that you guys provided a lot of input onto those forms and, you know, they've been modified, but we're continuing to modify them as we're learning where you guys are struggling with your systems and answering these questions. So we're still in that pilot period and any type of input that you have on a training or certification or how we can do that uh, to get approval and what that would look like, what kind of qualifications, we're certainly open for a discussion. But right now, I think we're more concerned about that form, making sure that it's adequate, that we're hitting all the things that we need to, and that it works for y'all when, when we do make the transition when uh, third-party assessors are able to do those. Does that, does that make sense or help? 
kind of understanding where we're at. It's not that we don't think anyone's qualified to do it. I think we're more concerned about having a form that works for everybody and that we're, we're protective of public health and that goal is being met. I would just add on for, for discussion or for your information. Um, you know, another, another challenge too is of course the, the, the timelines are pretty tight. So uh, the system we've had is, you know, has been working to help address those timelines. And so that's one of the challenges with a, with a third party um, is, is making sure we would be able to get the, get the approval in place, have a good system for getting the system, uh, the approval process in place so that an assessor is ready to go to, to once the event has been triggered, which no one can predict. Uh, to meet the to meet the timelines. So, like I just reiterate what Carrie Michelle said, if you all have feedback or ideas, we totally welcome that. Um, uh, I have talked to a lot of different states, at, at, um, and I don't know of one state that, that is doing this the same way uh, when it comes to the level ones, level twos. Y'all may know different, but when I've talked to region region uh, EPA region six states, everybody's doing this a little bit different. Uh, so. Um, your, your continued feedback and, and input on this is very valuable to us. I, I think uh, just something Charlie said at the beginning of his presentation, I think is, although it doesn't seem very new, uh, it does seem like we're still really in a pilot and, and you know, only being two years into a rule is really not that long a time for something as complex as, as the RTCR can, can be and the goal it's trying to achieve. Any questions, any other discussion, topics? I'm um, sorry. Uh, comments? Oh, another question. Okay. Um, regarding collecting a positive within 24 hours that Gary brought up, the rule states to, to collect the repeats within 24 hours or as soon as possible if the local laboratory is closed. For example, on Friday, I'm notified that a sample collected on Thursday was total coliform positive and E. coli negative. If my contract laboratory does not accept back T samples on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and I notify the TCQ of this, would I be granted approval to collect on Monday? We would be immediately, I'm, I'm glad this question got asked. Uh, we talk about this day in and day out uh, with, our, with our staff and our program. Uh, so the rules do say if a local laboratory is closed. So we're gonna get, when we have that conversation, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about a lot of things. We're gonna talk about, could you be sampling at a, at a different time where you're not, putting yourself consistently in a position to where if you had to react to a positive, your local lab is closed. Well, if that's happening time and time again, that's probably not a good sampling procedure. Uh, you're not gonna wanna put yourself in a position where you're always in a spot where if you get a positive, you're gonna come to us and say, sorry, can't take a repeat, my local lab's closed. What does local mean? We just had a situation two days ago where um, on Friday, uh, the system had an E. coli positive. They told us their local lab was closed. Our staff jumped on, found two other labs that they could use, and one of them easily within 30 minutes said, you bet, we'll take your samples. They processed those samples on a Saturday and were able to receive, receive the results. So if you don't ask the question of if another lab can take the samples, how do you know, how do you know that you can't get results? So that's just a perfect example we went through literally days ago where a system told us, oh, my local lab is closed, they're not taking samples this Friday. We were able to find a lab within 60 miles. They were able to get those samples, repeat samples collected within 24 hours. They were able to get results by the next day. And thankfully, they did not have an E. coli MCL. So we will go over that on a case-by-case -case basis with you. We need to ensure that you've done uh, diligence in trying to find labs that will take samples. You can always ship samples uh, if you need to. It really gets back to, Jessica mentioned this earlier, we really f are pushing and, and encouraging systems to have a contingency plan, have backup plans for what happens if you get a positive on a Friday and your local lab doesn't usually take samples. issue. So if you have an E. coli positive, there's no other lab around, don't be surprised under 46R, 46Q, Q. that we're going to ask you uh, for a boil water notice for special precautions because we're not sure about what is going on with your water at that particular point, especially if we're looking back past 
towards previous instances or looking at your water quality. So don't be shocked. Um, so please have that contingency plan ready to go for a secondary lab. Any other questions? <clears throat> yep, sure. Hey, I just want to take this opportunity to encourage y'all to reach out when you're doing your contingency planning. So we're working intimately with the laboratories on a daily basis. And, you know, as Gary just mentioned, you know, the local laboratory in that area wasn't taking, but because we already have an idea of what laboratories across the state will accept samples over weekends and whatnot, we can help you to try and figure out what your options are. So don't feel like you're stuck. And like I said earlier, you know, I really encourage you to plan ahead so that way when you get into this situation, you've already figured out what you're going to do. You know, it's kind of an emergency response kind of sort of situation, you know, not to the level of flooding and things that are happening right now, but you just want to try and plan ahead and we're here to help you with that. Charlie, thanks a lot. We're going to move on to our next presentation, our last presentation we have planned for the day. Uh, Matt Court, a senior groundwater rule compliance uh, staff member, is going to be providing some updates on the groundwater rule. He's approaching the uh, the dais here. Like Give him a minute to get <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he is seated now and he's ready to present. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Appreciate All it. All right. Thanks, Gary. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, let's see. Where are we at here? We got oh, okay. So anyway, while this is opening, I'll uh, just mention, I'm just going to give you a, um, I just wanted to go over kind of the brief overview of the major components of the groundwater rule. It's always good to refresh, you know, um, rule compliance, you know, components. And and, uh, um, and I also have at the end a few um, updates to give as far as what we've been seeing this year. And um, let's see if this thing's going to open here. Any ideas? Should I close this and try it again? Well, while this is doing this, I can just go ahead and talk about these updates I have. Okay, meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we may be having some some net some network issues. Okay, um, I mean, I can I can go over you know the major parts of the rule just just by memory here. Um, you know, the groundwater rule kicked in in 2009, December 1st, 2009. So we're approaching the 10-year mark, and and um, what we've seen recently is is violation numbers have been going down so you know that's i think that's a combination of things um you know just the length of time that the rule has been implemented um you know education people are you know more comfortable with it more familiar with the rule and also doing these types of things you know the public drinking water conference dwag you know it, it all helps to get the word out there to um so everybody you know is prepared and knows what to do with this rule and and with the groundwater rule, it, it's it's kind of a unique rule in that um, it's not like RTCR where it's just across the board monitoring every month. It it can have you know a lot of impact on you, and it can have very little impact on you depending on what type of sample history you get in your RTCR program. So um, you know the big part of it is triggered source monitoring, and that is triggered from your revised total coliform rule monitoring. So, um, okay, we got this thing going now, so. Where's the? Okay. So I'll just go right in here. I mean, um, you know, these are the three big um, parts of the rule. We've got um, periodic sanitary surveys 
these the pro, uh, goal here is to identify significant deficiencies. These are very similar to sanitary defects with a revised total coliform rule, but uh, it's it's more geared toward the groundwater rule. So there are eight elements that that our um, field investigators will look at when they go out on a on a uh, sanitary survey or a you know CCI the um, investigation that is every three years for community and every five for non-community systems so that's part of the rule and um, but the main thing is the triggered source monitoring that I was that I was talking to this is triggered from your uh, revised total coliform rule monitoring your routine you get a routine total coliform positive then you have to go out and sample, you know, take repeat samples, but you also have to do a full set of well samples. And then we have, um, you know, corrective action is the kind of the, the find and fix type approach, the corrective action. We have, uh, you know, a list of options to choose from depending on, um, you know, what, what the sample history is and, and the, the system itself. So. This is the flow chart that shows, um, you know, your trigger source monitoring, the uh, sanitary surveys, you know, or the CCIs, the, the, the investigations, and then the assessment source monitoring. And Jessica mentioned the assessment source monitoring earlier. This is, you know, the majority of these are from a, a condition of a rule exception. Um, if the system does get a rule exception for, you know, substandard well construction, um, setback issues, things like that, then we will have the system go ahead and take monthly raw samples. And so that's the three things that can all lead to corrective action. Um, we've got a couple of options on how to deal with the trigger source monitoring. And this is mainly for systems that are large that, that have a lot of wells. It, it's, it's a way to, you know, collect a lot of well samples in a short amount of time or collect no well samples. So the first option is trigger source monitoring plans. This is where you can identify representative wells, wells that are similar to each other in construction and, and the aquifers that they're pulling from. And then the option two is four log treatment. Now, four log treatment can be an option if a system wants to do it. That's everybody is welcome to do that. That will totally exempt you from the triggered source monitoring. And but it can also be used as a as a corrective action um, if you get E. coli positives regularly or if there's any significant deficiencies in the in the system. It may be something you know. It's a good. It's actually a good tool to to use the uh, uh, four log treatment because it's a way to, to keep a well going and, and keep, you know, providing, you know, the water from this source without having to drill a new well, but we just treat for the E. coli. So the sanitary surveys, just real quick, um, like I said, community systems are inspected every three years and non-community every five years. That's through our, you know, OCE or, um, field staff that go out and do these periodic surveys. The eight elements that they look at, we look at source, treatment, distribution, uh, you know, even get into um, um, record keeping, things like that, operator compliance. Um, so if any of these things, if our investigators feel like is a significant deficiency or is something that could cause, you know, contamination to the source, um, they will identify that as a significant efficiency and then you will have 120 days to fix that. Um, either 120 days or, you know, if it's some major issue, then we can work on a, a corrective action plan that, that may take additional time. But, but uh, basically, if you get a significant efficiency identified, then you'll have to go into uh, correcting that issue. So trigger source monitoring, uh, this is the big, the big one that, that um, you know, affects most systems. So, <clears throat> you know, if, uh, like I said, if you have four log treatment, you don't have to do trigger source monitoring. Um, but if you don't have four log treatment, then, then um, you're gonna have to sample each well that was in use within 24 hours of a routine distribution positive out of your revised total coliform sampling. So. Um, and, you know, and this 24-hour thing is just like the revised total coliform rule. We, you know, those need to be collected within 24 hours or, you know, let us know if, if you're having any issues with that. But, um, and, you know, trigger source monitoring plans, these, these really, I mean, we've got some systems that over 100 wells and, and they've reduced their required sampling down to 
maybe 10 well samples to do in that 24-hour period. So it really helps a lot with, with uh, meeting the demands of the rule. And I wanted to mention this too. This is this kind of trips people up sometimes. I I think more people are, you know, aware of of this now. But at the beginning of the rule, it, it created some issues or just some confusion. And um, so for each routine coliform positive that you get under RTCR, you have to collect a full set of well samples. Um, you know, that's even if all your positives are on one day. You have to look at it like, you know, with the routine sampling, if you get a positive, you have to take a complete set of three repeat samples. Well, for each routine positive, you also have to do a complete set of well samples. So, you know, the main confusion comes if, if all the positives occur on the same day. People think that they can just go out and get one round of well sampling, but it is a one-to-one -one thing. We verified this with EPA, even headquarters in Washington, and this is the way they want it to be. So um, another way I explain this is if, say you get, say it's a small system that has one well, you get a positive on the first, you go out and do your repeat sampling, and you also take your well sample. If you go out on the 15th and get another positive on a routine sample, then you have to do the same thing over again. That's two sampling events. So the confusion, like I said, is if those two positives were on the same day, people think that you can just get one round of well sampling, but it's still a one-to-one, -one, even if it's on the same day. Um, and, and the reason for that is just, you know, EPA always, they're big on data. So the more data you have, the more, you know, opportunity to find things, even if it's, you know, uh, created from one-day sampling from, you know, two positives on the same day, for example. But anyway, so... That's a big thing. I, want to, I always like to mention this because, you know, like I said at the beginning, it did create some confusion, but, but I think people are pretty on board with it now. Um, and, you know, providers, when we have con consecutive systems, so if you purchase water from somebody, if you're a groundwater system, you don't have any wells and you, you purchase water from a system that, that has the wells, you have to make a notification to that system that owns the wells to go out and do the triggered source monitoring. So, you know, basically it just, you have to go up the chain of consecutive systems to get to the sources to sample them. And um, so, you know, if you're a system that purchases and you don't have any wells, you get a positive, you gotta make those notifications up, up the chain to, uh, to allow the, the owning, you know, the system that owns the wells to sample those. Okay, moving along to assessment source monitoring. These, you know, these can be the result of a, what we call a hydrogeological sensitivity assessment. That's where we look at the well, we look at well construction, we look at, you know, what aquifer they're in, if it's a sensitive aquifer, we look at proximity to surface water, you know, all types of things that, and if we determine that, okay, this well looks susceptible to fecal contamination, then, then we could put that that system or that source on monthly raw sampling. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, I mean, the majority of these that we see are, is a condition of an exception, a rule exception. And it's usually, you know, a lot of them are sanitary control easement issues. Um, if you can't, you know, secure all the land around that well by signing off on all the landowners, then, then you know, we're not sure, we're just uncertain of what's going on in that, that area, so we want to collect the data of, of monthly uh, raw sampling. Um, you know, assessment source monitoring, it, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's a big part of the program, but, you know, triggered, like I said earlier, is, is, is the main one. But, but we do have a lot of systems that do monthly assessment source monitoring. So getting into corrective action, um, this happens when you either have an E. coli positive or if a significant deficiency is identified. And we have six possible corrective actions. Um, four of them were from the federal rule language, the, these four. You can correct all significant deficiencies, provide an alternate source of water, uh, eliminate this contamination source, or provide four log treatment. Um, just to get into this a little bit further is, you know, if we see, you know, a single E. coli 
first time ever, then what we'll usually tell people is to take that well offline, disinfect it, collect some special samples to you know determine the disinfection was was um, effective, and then after that we can you know put the well back online. But if we start seeing you know several E. coli positives, I mean it, you know if you get like there's a system recently that, that we've seen like I think three in the last two months and we went to Vorlog treatment you know that that's where we're gonna go if we start seeing multiple E. coli positives and, and it, it's just uh, um, if you're having contamination if you're well susceptible to fecal contamination you can continue to use it but we just need to do a little more stringent treatment process and the two the, the other two um, corrective actions, these are some that we added um, to the rule, and, and it's uh, disinfect the well according to AWWA procedures, or we can also go to, you know, assessment source monitoring, the monthly monitoring. Now, keep in mind, if we, if we pick one of these, then we have to also use one of the federal ones. We always have to use one of these federal ones, but... For example, what we, you know, like, a, like if it's a first occurrence, we'll usually do provide an alternate source of water, and then we'll pick this one, disinfect the well. So we'll use those two in combination, and, and that's, you know, for, you know, just kind of an anomaly situation. But uh, once you get into more E. coli positives, then we're going we're gonna to go up on the, the corrective action. So four log treatment. Um, this is basically, forelock treatment is 99.99% inactivation of viruses. So it's, it's very effective to use under the groundwater rule. It's, it's probably the biggest tool we have under the groundwater rule to, uh, to use. So it's, um, you know, like I said, it, it allows systems to, to use a well that may be susceptible to vehicle contamination, but then we just treat for it. Uh, going into that a little further, um, the TROT or Technical Review and Oversight team that Joel Klump mentioned earlier, they handle the CT studies. Um, but I've got a, you know, a little bit of information here. Like I said, it, it, this is the inactivation rate. Um, the most effective disinfectant for forward log treatment is, is free chlorine. Um, it can be achieved with, with these other disinfectants. We've got a couple that, that use chloramines, but it's really difficult you have to have a lot of storage to be able to use chloramines with or get four log credit with chloramines uh, you have to have a you know just a lot of storage capacity or a, a you know several miles of pipeline that that you may be able to get credit for ct in that in that pipe um, but like i said it, it's mainly set up for free chlorine that's the most effective way um, and sometimes you know you get a CT study back, and if you have a huge amount of storage and use free chlorine, it may tell you the the minimum specified residual may be below 0.2. In those cases, you still have to understand to boost that in distribution because the distribution requirement is 0.2 for free chlorine. So, you know, it's it's kind of two separate things. If you get a CT study back that says it's less than one of these required values. You still have to, in distribution, maintain these values. So, um, you know, but that is all indicated on your CT study approval letter from from the trot team, um, and that's that's rare that that happens. But we have seen some that that will come back, you know, less than 0.2. And you know, four log treatment is not required. I still have questions that, that and comments from people that think that four log treatment is required and even tr uh, trigger source monitoring plans and but four log treatment can be required as a corrective action but but a lot of systems just chose to do it because they didn't want to have to do the the trigger source monitoring so um, they are optional programs unless you get a corrective action um, the biggest I guess setback with with four log treatment, and this is not an issue for the bigger systems, but some of the smaller systems, is the the daily compliance monitoring of the disinfectant. Um, you know, small systems a lot of times don't have you know full time employees there every day, so so that becomes an issue. But um, larger systems, you know, 
it's usually not an issue, but it does require, depending on population, it re requires either um, a daily grab sample or continuous monitoring. That threshold is 3,300 population, so below that, it was just a daily grab sample at peak flow rate. Above that is just is continuous monitoring, so let's see. So reasons to choose, like I said, it mainly has to do with, with systems that have a lot of wells and, you know, <clears throat> you know, our big municipalities in the state, a lot of them, most of them have, you know, at least some forelock treatment going on to, to help, you know, maintain or comply with the rule. Um, that, that's the big thing. I mean, just it exempts you from the trigger source monitoring. So, and as far as um, applying for four log treatment, it requires a CT study. So with the groundwater rule, we have developed this, this single page um, program. It's, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Basically, you plug in these yellow fields. It's storage capacity and service pump capacity. And then these, the other boxes of the brown boxes over here will be auto-populated and it gives you a minimum specified residual to maintain in your storage tank. So um, this, for groundwater, it's, it's really simple, um, straightforward, but um, sometimes you may need to use a surface water uh, CT study template. It's a lot more involved, a lot more complex, but it, it, it takes, I don't know if you can read this, but, but this groundwater one, we're going to, we've set some, the variables to, it's kind of worst case scenario, like um, water temperature, 10 degrees C, um, pH is always below 9.5, um, you know, things like that that we've kind of set just to make it simple. But if you're a system that these values don't work, then you're going to have to use the surface water template. And, um, you know, that does happen. So, so um, you know, the surface template is just a lot more detail and, and it's more site specific for your exact water system. So, uh, but if you're just a standard groundwater system, I mean, this is a great, a great way to do a CT study. I mean, we're, we're just going to basically ask for this and then a, a diagram showing your facilities. So, like I said, TROT will um, review and approve those CT studies. And we'll just move past this. Um, you know, the, the groundwater rule, I mean, they've done studies that, that they, there are a lot of prevented waterborne illnesses from this rule impl implementation. Um, and then, you know, forelock treatment and trigger source monitoring plans you know, are, are good ways to work around the rule if you have a lot of wells. And then, you know, contact us at any time. Communication's always the key. We've got uh, FMT assistance, like they mentioned earlier on the presentations. We always like to push this program. So if you are interested in that, you can contact me or the FMT group. And here's my contact information. Um, just real quick, I was going to highlight a few things. Um, Jessica mentioned we had 18 E. coli positive raw sampling events in the third quarter of this year. And that's not a, a huge number. We always see a bigger number in the summertime when it's warmer. Um, out of those, I think we assigned two of them for log treatment. The rest were pretty much kind of a first occurrence type issues uh, or maybe, you know, the second occurrence in five years, something like that. So if it's not a regular thing, then we're going to, you know, probably just take it offline, disinfect it, and then move on. If it's going to be repeated, then we're going to, you know, move to, uh, or if we see those more regularly, we're going to move to four log. Four log does require a um, storage tank, so a lot of the smaller systems that, that may be good candidates for four log treatment may not have the, the storage tank, you know, to be able to deal with it. So that's, that's a thing that we'll talk to the system about and try to try to get them on board with, with um, getting into more treatment because the alternative is, you know, take the well offline and drill a new well, and nobody really wants to do that. It's extremely expensive. So um, four log treatment is a good tool is, is the point. Um, let's see. Um, 
we are seeing more significant deficiencies identified through the CCIs. So what that does, it, it, um, once our field staff identifies those significant deficiencies, we, get a, we have to create a compliance schedule in central office that's 120 days unless we've talked to the system and extend that. Um, so we are seeing more and more um, significant efficiencies identified and you know it's it's going to be some type of corrective action so just kind of a heads up on that that, that uh, you know your investigations may be asking you questions about about um, you know the groundwater role and significant efficiencies um, we are working with um, technical review and oversight team to try to really get on the same page as far as what they have as far as the assessment source monitoring is a condition of exceptions and then we're working toward you know monthly compliance on that right you know right now it's your sample history you know trot can can alter your exception um, they can um, you know make you do more sampling things like that but we're working toward getting all those into schedules so we can run a consistent compliance check on those. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, the, the trigger source monitoring violations, we're really encouraged that we've seen a gradual decrease pretty steadily since the rule was implemented. I mean, we were seeing, you know, 50 or more, you know, violations per month, and now we've, those are down to, you know, in the 20 range, you know, or, or less even, you know, in the winter months or even less. But we think that's a combination of things like, you know, outreach, things like this, and then just people being more educated with the rule and, and um, you know, better compliance. And we're also reaching out. Systems get positives. We, we call the systems, and we're trying to, you know, be more hands-on with, with uh, helping people comply with, these, with this rule. I think that's the biggest things that we've been seeing. Mainly wanted to outline the significant deficiencies, give you a heads up on that, that you might start seeing that. Um, and then, you know, four log treatment is, is, is a good effective tool for this rule. But that's pretty much all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Anything? Any questions for Matt? Anything on the email, Sean? <clears throat> I think you covered it all, Matt. <laughs> all right. One more time. Any questions for Matt on the groundwater rule? <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you very much, Matt. Appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you all very much. Um, that is our last presentation for, for this morning. Uh, I do want to re remind you all folks and encourage you to give us your feedback. Any topics you want to talk about? Any specific questions you had? You know, we had a question roll in last night that Joel was able to address in his updates today that was, uh, uh, I think, very important to that particular person, and Joel spent a good 10 minutes covering that. So that's exactly what we want to provide with you in this forum. Uh, we certainly appreciate all your participation, but we're always looking for topics or ideas uh, or anything you want to hear from or discuss in this forum. You can send all of that to um, um, our handy email box at dwog. D-W-A-W-G at tcq.texas.gov. And you can do that anytime. And we have numerous people on that email box that would receive that email and, and we would be in a, a position to respond to you or um, they would pass that along so we could put it on the agenda for the next WAG meeting. We do meet quarterly. We meet four times a year. Uh, this is our last meeting for 2018. Our next meeting uh, will be Tuesday, January 15th, 2019 in the new year. Um, I think that's it. Any any other questions, comments? Uh, we have a little time. Hey, Gary, I was going to jump in uh, when you mentioned ideas for presentations or, or dwag topics. Um, I also actually wanted to mention that for groundwater rule two, like I, you know, like I said, it's we're about the ten year point, and this is kind of the basic presentation that, that I give. Um, but if anybody's had any issues with the groundwater rule or any confusion or questions or has any ideas about things that you want me to cover in the PDW conference or at a DWOG meeting, you know, feel free to reach out to me and, and I'm always open for new ideas for presentations. So, so thank you. So with that, I want to thank all of our presenters today as well as all the staff that helped put this on uh, and our support from our webcast 
folks. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for their participation. With that, I think we are adjourned. Thank you.